Right now we've got um, Pia, who is going to be talking about cloud computing and government. Um, now Pia is someone who uh, definitely does not need an introduction at LCA. And that's why I'm actually going to give her one, because I think it's not fair when people who don't need introductions never get any. Um, but um, Pia has been the prolific member of our community for, uh, what, 10 years? Something like that? It's, it's, it feels like forever anyways. Um, she's been a past LCA organizer. Um, she, uh, she was a consultant and strategist uh, for an open source uh, consult consultancy. And uh, now she's an advisor to uh, Senator Kate Lundy. So um, hopefully she'll tell us uh, why we need to uh, go and talk to um, our government um, representatives to, uh, to make sure that they get the stuff. So please join me in welcoming uh, Pia. Oh. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, so I guess I'm actually here sort of on a, um, a bit of a, almost an anti-cloud rant, actually. <laughs> Um, and this was kind of inspired by a, um, a blog post I did a while ago, because of course, being a techie person and being someone who's working in an advisory capacity in Parliament House, I, you know, I get every day someone comes to tell me something new, uh, try and sell me something. Um, I've actually written a, um, a new song about these people, I call it Grid, um, and um, I've had a lot of fun playing with some of these people because there's a lot of really important stuff the government needs to know about technology. And not all of that filters through, strangely enough. And I didn't actually mean to throw a filter joke in there, but anyway. Um, but there is... Um, so, for instance, I was actually invited to a, a cloud um, discussion roundtable with um, a whole bunch of cloud vendors um, and with a whole bunch of very, very senior public servant and government people. And, um, and I managed to keep my, myself quiet for quite a while until we got to a point about three quarters of the way through this, this two or three hour thing where um, one of them said, well, we can guarantee that there will be no privacy issues because we can guarantee there will be no personal data in any of our cloud. <laughs> At which point I said, okay, I just need to say something. Um, that's absolute bollocks. And um, proceeded to then sort of have a chat about, well, you know, even if we were to take the strict definition of what is personal data or citizen data or private information now, um, you know, there are still going to be problems. But when, you know, when you start to understand that every time you fill in a web form, there's, you know, IP addresses, there's, there's um, cookies, there's, you know, filling in a name, filling in a postcode, um, and all of that is going into a form somewhere which is probably not, you know, in Australian jurisdiction, then you start to sort of go, okay, well, that's a ridiculous claim to make. Um, but these are sort of some of the things that are coming up. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff, some of the issues, and largely this is a plea for help. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go through. So opportunities, absolutely, and you've got plenty of other people here that will talk to you about, you know, why, you know, all the, all the great things about the cloud and, and um, there, there's a whole bunch of buzz around. Um, oh, I'll get to that. Is it new? Somewhat. Um, who remembers SOA? Who remembers SAS? All these things. So I, I, my favourite website is soafacts.com and I've, I've brought along a few um, for your com uh, amusement. But basically, a lot of the hype that we're hearing about cloud We've been through several times before. So here's a couple of uh, definitions of SOA that we could very easily remove SOA and insert cloud and they mean exactly the same thing. SOA invented the internet and the internet was invented for SOA. In the last year, SOA increased Turkey's GDP by a factor of 10. One person successfully described SOA completely and immediately died. <laughs> Another person successfully described SOA completely and was immediately outsourced. That was a government person, obviously. Um, SOA is not complex, you are just dumb. Um, it is a very worthwhile website to see. Unfortunately, cloudfacts.com has been taken by someone who wants to use it seriously. But um, there is a lot of uh, FUD, there is a lot of mythology, and there is a lot of misconceptions around what cloud means. And yet, uh, there are a lot of people sort of saying, oh, yay, we need to go with the cloud, that's fantastic. Um, having said that, I do just want to throw in a small caveat. There are also some very, very, very clever people in government who do get this stuff. Um, and so, you know, don't think that everyone in government has no idea what's going on. There are some really, really good things going on, and I'll get to that in a minute. But, um, yeah, there's also a, a, an enormous amount of need for clarity of what is and isn't possible. Because basically, a lot of people see government plus cloud equals fat wads of cash. And I'm certainly seeing, you know, a lot of the vendors sort of take that approach. Um, and I mean, and like I said, not that there's nothing good to sell, but yeah. 
So there's the sort of sales pitch that we're seeing. Um, um, uh, cloud computing will save the environment. Cloud computing will be more agile. Cloud computing will make sure that you can have cross-environment support and be able to support people on their mobiles or their, their laptops or their, their netbooks or whatever. Cloud computing will save you money. And um, I guess the, what I try to put to people is not to say none of that is true. There are certainly circumstances where the, those things will be true. But you actually have to look at the small print. You actually, by saying, okay, cloud computing is better for the environment. Okay, what is the cloud solution that's being offered to you? What is it? What is it running? How much power does it generate? What, what, what is the carbon footprint of it? Like, if, if you're actually going to buy into the concept on that premise, make sure that it actually fulfills the premise, I guess. Because um, what you're basically doing is you're taking a bet. You're saying that the way that your government environment or company or you know, home system or, or whatever, the way that you can do it is worse, either environmentally, in terms of agility, in terms of um, cross-environment support, in terms of um, financially, is worse than how someone else out there can do it. So you've really, like, for, and I sort of am always trying to suggest to people that they just make sure that they look at the small print and actually check all that stuff out. Um, there are a lot of issues that need to be carefully considered. Um, jurisdiction, um, there are rules around what data governments, departments and agencies are allowed to host offshore. So for instance, there's a few cloud vendors who are saying, um, use our cloud, it's fantastic, but no, we won't run a cloud in Australia. Now, that sounds kind of dumb, you know, to, from one angle, but on the other angle, you know, if that company goes down, if that hardware is compromised, if, you know, if, 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 um, they are under, uh, and regardless of the technicalities, they're under a, um, a mandate to make sure it's under Australian jurisdiction, under certain circumstances, under a lot of circumstances. Um, so, and, and there are some really good examples of um, cloud initiatives where they're not going to use that because they don't fulfill those particular requirements. Um, there's issues around standards. I actually went to a cloud briefing at government, um, at Parliament House um, by one vendor, and all the vendors will remain unnamed. Um, and, um, and I sort of asked the question, well, you know, how about um, standards? You know, do you store um, the information that you get? Is the data able to be transported, transportable across different systems, across um, different formats? Um, are we able to retrieve that? And he was just, he, he looked at me and said, huh? Um, that was a little disturbing. Um, it, it's really important that we make sure that as we move into using more of this sort of technology, that we make sure that we um, come at it, I think, with a premise of openness. How can we make sure that the, uh, the standards are open? How can we make sure the APIs that interact with the application in the cloud are, are open so that we can um, encourage citizens or businesses or other government departments, goodness, you know, heaven forbid, um, to engage with our um, system, to engage with our data, to engage with us. Um, uh, data is obviously a, a, an important thing. What happens if that company goes down? What happens if... Um, if everything is, their entire system is wiped out for whatever reason, how can we uh, keep up and running? Um, how can we make sure that we can get our data back? And I, I just want to bring up, and it's an old story, but I think it's kind of relevant for the same sort of reasons. But um, years ago, there was a, a case, this is fairly soon after the DMCA um, uh, sort of laws were brought into the US, but um, a, a company had their data in a highly secure system that a, a company ran. Um, they had a, a contract dispute and didn't want to um, continue paying that company for whatever reason, doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. They hired someone to reverse engineer the security of the system to get their own data out. They were then charged, uh, they were then um, um, taken to court and I think that the company, the, the security company actually won, um, the, that the client was charged with you know, breaking the DMCA, reverse engineering a system to get access to their own data or were held, held liable for that. So it, it's really important that there is always the assurity you can get access to your data, that it's available in a format that you can read, and that kind of thing. Privacy, I mentioned before about, you know, our, our cloud will, um, uh, you know, will never store any private data. There are, is a lot of confusion around that, and, I, and these are sort of things that people need to be aware of. And SLAs is another one. Um, how can you be sure that you're going to get that two hour turnaround, or 30 second turnaround, or you know, two year turnaround, or whatever it is you're paying for? Um, and if you don't get it, what do you do? <laughs> you know, particularly if the exit costs of that particular cloud uh, system are so high that really you've got no option. So have a look at your exit costs, have a look at your portability, and have a look at um, actually, in fact, if things go wrong, what are we actually going to be able to do about it? Back into a cheery note. Um, 
The government approach, uh, there is actually a cloud strategy from Ajimo. Have anyone read it? A couple. Have anyone, does anyone know what, who Ajimo are? Okay, a few more. Um, for the rest of you, Ajimo is the Australian Government Information Management Office. Um, it is the uh, agency that, um, it actually sits under finance, but it's effectively the office of the Australian CIO. That's her role, the person who runs Ajimo. And, um, and they, they actually do some really cool stuff. There are some mixed opinions, but I, I reckon they do some pretty good stuff. Um, what, uh, who, you read the cloud strategy, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ajimo are basically in charge of putting out, of, of putting out, <laughs> Ajimo are in charge of um, um, publishing things like best practices, advice for government, um, uh, they're, they're in charge of a whole bunch of things, but they, they tend to be the, I guess, the, the definition of specifications for how government do things, of which some people ignore and some people use, but you know, more and more people are starting to use as they see um, some values there. Um, um, and data warehousing, I think, is another part of the broader agenda which fits very strongly into this. Um, the, has anyone heard of um, Gershon? I'll, I'll get to the Ajimo strategy in just a second, but has anyone heard of the Gershon review? A few of you? Um, how many people have anything to do with government? Not many of you, okay. So just very quickly, because it does actually, how many people here run IT businesses or work in IT businesses? How many of those sell to government? Okay, right. So I'll just briefly go into this, but basically there was a huge review as to how the government used IT, which is really exciting actually, because even though IT procurement policy is not something that gets everyone excited, um, actually it's directly related to the ability for government to do cool stuff, because if you're only allowed to buy such and such a product, then you can't you know, do anything outside of the limitations of that particular product, and all of us can think of many examples of that, of course. Um, so really, um, them looking at how they procure IT has been really good. And one of the recommendations that came out of that, that there should be more um, consolidation of, of data warehousing, um, of how government you know, um, does data warehousing. Of course, that's going to apply directly to cloud because there's all this talk about private versus public cloud. Um, there's generally when there's looking at cloud, they sort of send, tend to look at, and this is my personal opinion, but there's a lot of, well, what are, what are Amazon and Google doing? And what can we do privately? I don't think there is enough understanding of some of the options here. And I mean, I know you know a bunch of Australian vendors that do call cool, um, um, sort of cloud capability, but there, there really isn't that knowledge in government. So anyone that's doing cloud stuff here really should be going to government saying, here are our cloud solutions. Can we come and brief you about it? By the way, we'd like to do a talk um, because um, they're, they're just not really hearing about the um, uh, the Aussie options as a, as another option available to them. Now I'm just going to flick stra briefly to hopefully. To oh, it's on the next thing. No, hold on. Aha. So this is the the draft document of the cloud computing thing, and I mean they they go yeah you know, they go into the opportunities and applic um, applicability for use by the Australian government of cloud. Um, now a lot of these sort of documents coming out are kind of fluffy. This one does actually have some good stuff in it though, and it is actually worth having a read through if you want to understand where government are coming from. For starters, they recognise that it's a way of delivering services, it's not new, um, which is you know, above and beyond what most people are. But um, the other thing is they go into define it, and I just want to point out one thing which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, where are we, page? Alright, so they define it as um, having five characteristics, you know, it's all good stuff to read, but Cloud, I like this, cloud computing is the result of several technology advances, including reliable high-speed net, oh no, that's the wrong bit, sorry, keep going, oh no, that's right, reliable high-speed networks, very large global class infrastructures deployed by vendors like Google and Amazon, virtualized capabilities, commodity server hardware, and my favorite too, open source software, which has slashed the cost of um, software for data centers, and the adoption of Open Web 2.0 standards, which has made the development of applications of the cloud much faster and easier. Um, it's always nice to have sort of a recognition of the part that this plays because I think that actually the whole focus on cloud, similar to the whole focus on um, Gov2.0, which I know is a stupid term, but it's the working term and everyone knows it and so we're just going to continue to use it. Um, but this whole idea of how government uses technology, how it engages with citizens, how it opens up its data, how it is more transparent, combined with how they use the cloud, presents enormous opportunities for open source, for open standards, for a whole bunch of stuff that we all do every day and love. Um, so I think it, it's worthwhile with what you're thinking about uh, and what you're doing in this space 
considering how this applies to government. Why should you care? You know, if most of you aren't working in government, which the numbers um, of hands indicated, well, here's why you should care, because government is the number one ICT procurement in Australia. They spend more money than anyone else, which means that any decisions that they make regarding IT procurement policy actually inevitably affect the entire market, the entire industry, and all of us trying to just get on and hack. So that's why government is a little bit important, I think. And that's why I work in it, which, you know, I certainly take a lot of um, crap to do, but it is um, important. Um, okay, so going back. So, um, the government definition was um, on-demand self-service. Um, but no, I won't go into that because you can read the document. Um, if you have all your governments till uh, the private versus public cloud is going to be pretty important because a lot of people could say, oh, well, private cloud, well, that's what we're doing now. So they'll just sort of do what they've always done and, and whatever. But it does, this whole interest pre presents a great opportunity to say, okay, what about standards? What about openness? What about interoperability? Um, how about how... Um, I can create, because I mean, I've, I've seen enormous projects where, um, you know, government decides on a particular technology and then actually has to figure out a way that people can interoperate with that technology. Whereas if they started from the premise, well, it has to be interoperable to start, then you wouldn't have the reverse engineering of the, your own technology solution. So um, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities there. This is my cry for help. <laughs> Please help. Um, there, um, there are always, you know, constantly um, people coming through Parliament House, people going to the different members, people going to the various ministers that I guess are, are involved in this space. Um, and at the moment there is, just to give you a bit of a taste, so you've got um, Minister Gary Gray, um, who's um, uh, uh, in charge of AGIMO. Uh, he's the Special Minister of State, which means that he sits across both finance and he sits across... Goodness. He sits across finance and he sits across something else, which has forgotten me right now. Anyway, um, but he's very much in charge of um, um, the IT procurement um, standards uh, in terms of the um, specifications of how government uses IT and that kind of stuff. He's, he's very good to get in top contact with and he's got some very, very um, good people and I think he's going to be quite good for that role. Uh, you've got Minister Conroy, of course, um, who's mostly relevant to this from the digital productivity role. And um, digital productivity is the role which he is responsible to the Prime Minister for. And um, that ends up being, well, how do we as a nation use technology? So that's going to feed into this a bit. Um, you've got um, uh, oh, Minister Carr, of course, is probably the third and other really important one, looking at it from a science from perspective, from a research perspective, from an industry development perspective. So those three, there's, there's different things you can tell to each. But um, in terms of building up the industry, in terms of building up what's happening in Australia, in terms of getting good advice and good technologies in the government, you know, they're probably a good start. Um, okay, I think the only other thing I want to go through was, which I don't think I went through enough. No, that's probably enough. So, I guess I'll go for questions, because I figured that there would probably be a lot of questions, because I'm usually the, the um, what's the word, scapegoat for pretty much everything the government does wrong. So, bring it. Terry. I could yell it out. Pia, how, how do we help? How does a person who's not involved with government at all participate in, in this? Okay, um, it, uh, and when you say participate, uh, okay, so there's a bunch of things you can do. Um, okay, first of all, being helpful. <laughs> I know this sounds you know, quite bizarre, but um, the, the reason that I actually even got the job that I have is because years ago when the Australian-US Free Trade Agreement was being negotiated and I was one of the, you know, nutty people out there saying, oh, this is a really bad idea. Um, I went to see the, at the time, Shadow Minister of ICT give a talk about the Australian-US Free Trade Agreement and particularly about Chapter 17 on you know, the DMCA chapter, as we all like to call it. Um, and, um, and she spoke and she made sense. And I was really there to heckle, so you know, my, I was a bit deflated, but I went up to her afterwards and I said that was really good and that was, that was my boss now, Kate Lundy. So I kept in touch with her and just over the years just tried to sort of say, look, here's something you should probably know about, here's something you should probably know about, here's something you should probably know about, and just tried to sort of just keep her across things that I thought was important. She actually came and spoke at two Software Freedom Days and just got the importance of, of openness um, as, a, as, a, as an important premise with technology and, and also got the importance of technology generally. Um, and she, you know, when she came in, she, I think even now she still has to explain to some of her colleagues the importance of the internet. Um, but, you know, so just continuing to be helpful. So that when she came up and she wanted to get a, 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 an advisor, she asked me who I thought, and I 
happened to be free, and so it all went from there. But so the first thing is just to be to be helpful. Um, another person gave me a great example where they sent a letter to um, their local member about something they were really cranky about, OOXML, um, and. Um, and the member came back and said, you know, said, come in, let's have a chat about it. By the way, I noticed that you do electric bikes. That's great. Um, would love to hear more about that. You know, friendly um, dialogue is, is truly the first step because it is too easy for people who are um, not aligned with the agenda that you're trying to drive. Uh, it's too easy for them to say, oh, they're just ranty pants. You don't need to listen to them. Um, unless you can be extremely helpful, extremely um, uh, calm and, and, and convincing in the way that you present it. And of course, there are some you know, very, very good examples of, of that kind of dialogue where one side of the debate is just like, no, we can't do that because we're all going to die. And the other side is going, well, actually, here are all the reasons why that's ridiculous. Um, so, so good dialogue is the first way. And writing letters, if you write to your rep and you write to the minister, they have to respond to you. I mean, it might take a while, but they have to respond to you. Um, just a word of warning, some officers treat letters more importantly than emails. And when I say more importantly, they think that a letter stands for you know, a certain amount of people and the email stands for less. A lot of officers like ours treat it all, we, we treat tweets importantly. You know, um, every piece of engagement that we have is, is treated um, as, as important. But um, yeah, letters are actually really, really good and you, and you have to get a response. So I mean, if, if a minister gets you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 letters about an issue, it, it sort of starts raising the flags about, well, there's something going on here. We don't. You know, what's going on, what is it that we don't know, that they know, that, and, um, and why are they being so nice to us, you know, <laughs> um, as opposed to ranty pants at us. Um, so there's writing letters, there's getting involved, there's meeting with them, your, your local member has to meet with you, um, and again, it might take a while. Um, my, my dad wanted to meet with a, a particular member um, of the state government and um, eventually said to the guy, look, you're not in government now. If you ever want to be in government, then surely you'd be busy then. So if you don't have time now, then how are you ever going to have time? Why would I ever vote for you? And they've got a meeting the next day. Um, and uh, so yeah, meet with them, get in touch. The other thing you can do is actually help to build up that sort of very public um, case for the issue that you're talking about. Um, you know, making sure that there are good blogs, good information out there. But, I mean, Linux Australia, I believe, and you know, always have, um, is, a, is a tool for the community to be able to do this kind of stuff. There's no reason why there couldn't be a, a group of people as like a subcommittee or a, a special interest group of, of Linux Australia, which is all about getting together and representing the best interests of that community, of our community. I think there'd be a small conflict of interest there, John, but, uh, and Linux Australia, of course, would have to be... <laughs> I think lots of people should volunteer, but it should be apolitical as well. Linux Australia should be going to all parties and independents. Did I mention independents? And, um, and be talking to them about these kinds of things. Um, but you know, Linux Australia is a body that should, should be able to do that kind of stuff. Because like, th there are heaps of groups out there that purport to represent us. They try to represent us as IT professionals. They try to represent us as an industry. They try to represent us as an Australian industry. They try to represent us as a cloud industry. They try to, you know, there's lots and lots of messages going out there. So if we're not actually representing ourselves, then, you know, we're, we're already spoken for. Does that answer your question a little bit? I'm, I might even do a blog post about how to get engaged in government, see how much trouble I get in. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, Pia, can you hear me? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, leading on from that, um, you'd be aware you're involved in the public sphere thing last yep. year. Uh, is there any um, more, coming? more coming or and in what form sort of thing? Is that going to... But yeah, I would like to see that sort of enshrined in some way. Absolutely, so yeah. do we. So Thanks. for every, everyone else, one of the projects that we did last year, which um, and the year before actually, we've been doing for about 18 months, which is kind of exciting in a really wanky government way, is um, like for anyone that cares about democracy, which I hopefully you all do, um, is trying to look at okay, how can government better engage with in a really in a meaningful way, and not like a fluffy, oh, we better look like we get a few people's perspective, but in a really meaningful way with people. So we sort of took a bunch of sort of traditional conferencing ideas, but we must, um, uh, put it together with, you know, um, modern communications, I uh, haven't been, and, um, and came up with a, a mechanism to, um, uh, came up with basically just a methodology for doing um, consultations on issues that not only came out with some sort of outcome like, oh, here's what we recommend, but could it actually be applied to live policy development. 
you know, why shouldn't at every point of policy development, whether it be the original design, the, um, the, the detailed design, the actual implementation of that policy, and then the ongoing maintenance of that policy, um, there's no reason why citizens shouldn't be able to participate in all of those levels and be able to actually contribute to and make policy better. Um, so we, um, so the, the answer to the question is we ran three. There were four more that have been run, two by government departments and two by universities that have adopted the methodology and collaborated with us to do it. And, um, and we're going to continue sort of pushing the, the barrow that, you know, it should be a part of normal business for government. Now, there has been um, the um, Declaration of Open Government and the Gov2 Task Force report, of which the one of the main recommendations was all government activities should have public consultation, you know, in, in proper public consultation, it done with the public in a public way. And um, so those kind of recommendations are starting to be filtered through. A lot more of them are starting to do these consultations. And um, there are actually some good websites which are starting to collate examples of Australian consultation in that sort of method, um, in that sort of way, which has been really good. We, we do have challenges, though, that um, it is sometimes difficult to demonstrate the value of these consultations. So the whole reason we did these things was to, to show, actually, we got really good feedback, really good input, amazing outcomes, amazing suggestions. You know, it was all really good. Um, but the difference is that that's partly because we truly value what people have to say. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of what government does is about minimizing risk, is about which then infers that community input is a risk. Um, and that is how a lot of people see it. So um, yeah, there's a lot of hurdles there to follow, but hopefully it's going. In terms of where next for us, we, uh, we have a bunch more planned for this year, and some of them will hopefully be around actual policy that we're working on uh, with her new portfolio responsibilities. We'll see how we go. Should be fun. Any other questions? God, no one's throwing OXML. Yep. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, within the uh, bounds of what we can uh, talk about here today, yep. whether from the uh, working as an advisor in the minister's office, whether you had any thoughts on the um, uh, comparative performance of different departments and agencies uh, post in, in this year or so post uh, Gershon, and oh, uh, moving into the um, different cloud strategies that people are working on. Okay, so from a position of cloud, actually the most interesting one to watch, I think, I think this is public. Yes, yes, it's public. Um, <laughs> yes, yes it is. Um, Ajimo um, are actually um, doing a bunch of cloud stuff. Uh, so it's not just like the, the paper and stuff, they're actually going to be doing stuff. And that's going to be great because then they're not just putting out sort of um, recommendations and support for people, but they're actually demonstrating you know, here is how you can do it, here's how you can do it well, here's how you can, you know, do it safely within Australian jurisdiction, all that kind of stuff. Um, there is, um, there's actually some good case studies in that document, which I've probably closed, haven't I? Oops. Doo -doo -doo. Um, I will actually open, oh, yeah, whoops, sorry, hold on. Hello, Debian. Yeah, no, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, that's all good. Um, there are actually some examples in this, which I'll just quickly bring up because it's probably going to be better than... But, but Ajimo are going to be one to watch over the next couple of months, I think. In terms of other examples, um, pilots and proofs of concept. So there's ATO, ABS, and IMI have done a bunch of stuff. Um, and, but, but I mean, there is a lot of, lot of questions around that private-public sort of space and, and what, it, what is appropriate for government to do and what's not appropriate for government to do. Um, because, I mean, you could almost say that a private cloud, you know, in a, in a way competes with the market. Um, but there are some things, for instance, that um, government um, could set up a private cloud in order because they have the same security requirements, they, have, they want to pull their resources, they have really good people, whatever. Um, and I think that, the, that that's going to be a bit of a competing tension, I think, over the next little while. But um, there's also the question around, again, data. So. Um, I mean, are you in an, uh, an Australian company or international doing cloud stuff? Uh, Australian, Australian government. Oh, well, I've changed my tune then. Um, I, 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 think that, I, I think that the big thing missing at the moment is looking at Australian companies that do cloud because that actually does solve a lot of the problems for some particular implementations that people <laughs> want to do. 
Um, and there's just, there's just not really the, the discussion around that at the moment. It's like either Google or Amazon or we do it ourselves. And um, that's been a, a, a bit of a problem, but I think that'll be fixed pretty soon. Um, and, um, but yeah, in terms of actual other case studies, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and pull together a bit of a blog post around um, um, pointing some, some stuff. That might be helpful. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I'd say most Australians have the false impression that they have some kind of right to privacy. Um, <laughs> and it's false. Uh, has there been anything going along to try and increase and more secure actually individuals' rights? Uh, for example, actually being able to have it so you're not pretty sure that the government will do covert surveillance on you through having your mail and stuff in the cloud and anything to actually mm. go a bit further on individuals' rights as opposed to yeah, yeah, yeah. just using it. So there's a couple of things that have been set up. There's been a set up a thing called the Office of the Information Commissioner. Now the Office of the Information Commissioner has three roles effectively. Uh, it has the Information Commissioner, which um, is looking at FOI and is looking at that kind of holding government to account data that people want access to and, and, and is doing, and there's been major reforms around FOI, which is kind of cool. There's the, um, uh, there's the privacy commissioner and there's the, something else. Huh, I'm, not, I'm not having a good day today. Sorry, it's all the martial arts I didn't talk just before now. Um, but um, the privacy commissioner looks at all that kind of stuff. And I, I think that, I thought that there was actually some work done, some policy work done to sort of try and strengthen some of this stuff. Um, and there has been um, a, certainly a lot of consideration around well, what constitutes personal data, for instance. Um, is it that very strict old perspective of you know, personal information as in their name, address, their you know, geospatial location, that kind of stuff? Or is it also their IP address when they fill out a form on a government website? Is it, their, um, is it the fact that we hold, you know, we, we, we store that form or, or whatever for a while and, and maintain that information. That, that, I think there are a lot of questions around that and um, I think what's going to happen basically in the short term is we're going to see cloud being used for stuff which isn't um, a, like a lot of privacy sort of information and um, while they figure a lot of that kind of stuff out. But I mean the best thing is just sort of... And on as well, so to say if you use various cloud services to say as an individual using cloud to say email or yeah. microblogging. Uh, and coming from a thing of uh, government saying subpoenaing uh, all your records uh, there, I mean, in, yeah. in certain places it happens yeah. and no one gets told and you, you don't know. Is there anything trying to sort of solidify, uh, sort of you're right there to know about this kind of thing and have a bit more uh, personal security about having data versus on your person versus in a, in a cloud? I don't know of anything in Australia. Or is it convenient for the... Uh... <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it's even being thought of in that way at the moment. Um, I don't, I think that there are... Um, a lot of questions around cyber safety, the sort of new catchphrase at the moment. Um, and a lot of cyber safety ends up being around, um, you know, so that people don't get um, uh, caught out in, in scams or, or don't get cracked or don't get, um, you know, or, or, or children getting um, groomed and that kind of stuff. I don't. I don't know of, but I, I will have a look for, and I'll um, add it to the blog that I do on this talk. Um, but I'll have a look for and see if there's any sort of other reports and stuff that are going on. I know that there was a big cyber safety committee last year that reported and had a very lengthy book with some um, some useful recommendations. Um, but I'll, I'll have a look and see what I can find. But yeah, in terms of what you're referring to and referring, I, I don't think there's there's anything looked at yeah, here. Yeah, it seems one of those places that will fall off the radar because yeah. it's hard for explaining it to a large section yeah. of the population until they're actually screwed themselves. Well, the thing um, is that, like, right, I mean, you know, there, there are rights now to be able to, you know, look at information that people would probably feel very uncomfortable about. And it's been interesting to watch people get very, very um, um, hot under the collar about some of the new things that are being looked at when it's actually stronger than that now. Um, but let, let's have that conversation a bit later. There, there's, yeah, some stuff there, but I'll try and add it to a blog. Anything else? As I said, it's more of a call for help and beware the cloud sort of talk, but... Yes, but you also said that everyone approaches you. Sorry? You also say everyone approaches you when there's a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, bring it, yep. Well, it's not a problem, but I, oh, I guess a year ago, I um, went to fill in a web form on, the, I think it was the AECMA <laughs> site, and they got you to enter your sort of name, date of birth, sort of, all the firstborn. But the thing is, they've been very clever and most unusual and outsourced the quiz 
or form to a US company and that's where all their data got stored. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, and I was just, I was a bit stunned by this at the time. I thought surely not, but in fact they did. And um, should, is this something we should get upset about and should we approach someone and say, look, you've done a bad thing here? So in the, the spirit of the talk which I just gave, which is about applying martial arts for the workplace, I suggest getting upset never actually helps you. Um, but you write a very well-reasoned, questioning letter to your local MP to say, look, I noticed this and it's a bit concerning to me for this reason. Um, do you think that um, it is a, a, a danger for Australian information to be um, you know, shared in this way, and used in this way? And just ask the question, see what happens. It's, it's only by asking the question and getting people curious about the, the issues that, that um, sort of change happens. It's not me. Um, okay, so does that answer the question? Yeah, but um, a lot of it's just about raising awareness. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And um, um, yeah, I'll put up a blog post about this probably tonight. And um, if anyone is interested in the broader sort of open gov, gov2o gov stuff, which I think is very, very firmly related, then um, uh, there's also mini-conf tomorrow stuff about open government. Oh, thank you very much.